Around the world, people live different lives, doing different things that are unique and make us who we are, writing our own stories and learning new things along the way. We all learn different things. We all face different challenges and obstacles, but manage to get through them one way or another. We as humans go through our own journeys, and we learn as we build our own resilience. No matter how much we get beat down, what matters is how we get back up. And everyone loves a good story. Welcome to the Neil Coots Show. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in to today's show. Today's guest is Katie Underwood. Katie was once a, a pop singer in the music industry. As well as that, she runs her own spiritual well-being businesses. But um, without further ado, thank you very much for coming onto the show there, Katie. Hi, thanks for having me. Good to be here, Neil. You're welcome, Katie. Katie, tell me a bit about yourself. Um, where did you grow up? I am an Adelaide girl. I spent oh, the wow. first 19 years of my life there, so mm. did all my schooling and um, spectacularly failed my maths and computer science degree <laughs> that I was attempting to do at Adelaide University. Yeah. Uh, and then by the time I got halfway through that, realised that uni life wasn't for me and that I wasn't going to become a statistical analyst after all, mm -hmm. uh, I moved to uh, to Melbourne. So that was 1996 and that was really kind of where my life began. But, yeah, grew up happily enough in Adelaide. Oh, wow. So uh, what got you into music? Uh, look, I was always exposed to music. Mm -hmm. um, according to my parents' uh, reports of my childhood, I started singing almost as soon as I could talk uh, and I would sing quite annoyingly to just about everything, adverts, songs, Christmas carols, you name it, I sung it, drove my sister crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, and um, from there it sort of progressed naturally. I started um, playing piano when I was six. Oh, yeah. I played for 10 years, classical um, trained mm -hmm. and then around 11 I joined my school choir and I stayed with them for a few years and then when I hit high school I went with the Adelaide Girls Choir and I was there with them for five years. Um, so it was just a natural progression. So I've always sung um, but my years in the Adelaide Girls Choir were really foundational stuff. I think I, I got my love of that choral layered group singing there oh. um, and it's never left me. So what was it like being part of a, the girls choir? Did you have a lot of, did you have to do a lot of traveling, a lot of rehearsals and stuff like that? Oh, we didn't travel so much. It was just based in um, Adelaide. We were, um, yeah, the Adelaide girls choir had not started traveling interstate at that point. Hmm. Um, but yeah, rehearsals every Saturday, and then we'd you know we'd have uh, concerts throughout the year. So being on stage and performing in a large group, and of course mm. we're talking about you know fifty to a hundred girls here. Oh wow! Um, that was a great uh, foundation for just that concept of being on stage and performing. So you know, getting over your nerves, but also having the support of all of the girls around you. Um, but just being surrounded by this sea of voice. Oh, uh, yeah. It was just something I fell in love with. Oh, well. So did you, was it, how can I say, was it, what was it like? Did you lose a lot of your, like, high teenage years because of these uh, commitments to the choir or was it, it just was just something oh, like no. a hobby? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was the kind of child I was into everything. Mm. So as well as being in choir, I was in the athletics team. I was in the, the um, so this is in my, in my high school years, yeah. I was on the debating team in the school band. I was doing athletics. I was doing the school um, magazine oh, and wow. I was attending choir and I was playing softball. Oh, wow. So I was pretty much busy doing stuff almost every night of the week and then Saturdays would either be softball or there might be a performance, you know, a few times a year. So I liked being busy. Yeah. Uh, my parents knew that, that yeah. if they didn't give me stuff to do, I would drive them insane. So they kept my schedule quite full yeah. and I liked that. Um, and not a lot has changed. I think I've spent the last five years really learning to do less <laughs> and to be okay with that. But yeah. for many, many years it was like, right, what else can I possibly squeeze into my <laughs> my life and my schedule? So for better or worse, that's how it was for a long, long time. But, yeah. So was it? 
was it challenging for your parents having to drive you here and there everywhere every day? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> Although, like, the, the advantage was, um, that's right, my sister and I did gymnastics on a Tuesday night mm. and it was an hour class. And I remember once when we were a bit older, mum and dad telling us that, you know, it was the only hour a week that they got off. <laughs> so they could do adult things mm. when we were at gymnastics, <laughs> which, of course, we were horrified to think about what our parents were up to when we weren't with them. Um <laughs> So, you know, mm. it's just kind of a, a win-win on, on that hand. And I the same for um, softball. You know, we had, we'd had we play multiple games and be gone for three hours and Dad didn't always stick around. He would just drop us off and pick us up. So mm. I think, you know, even though it was the driving to and from, it gave my parents, I guess, some time to do things that they wanted to do. And as a parent now, I understand how valuable that is. Yeah, no, I get that. I just had a daughter and it just uh, it feels like, you're always busy and you just wish you could get a break, yeah? Yeah, how old is your daughter now? <laughs> she's a, a year and a half, so she's walking mm-hmm. around and yeah. getting into everything. So it's it's a bit more than a full-time job, as you can imagine. Yeah, well, I, well, I don't have to imagine. I know exactly <laughs> and I had twins. So, oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, you can expect to be that busy uh, yeah. until they start school. And then when school starts, suddenly there's a bit more space um, but up until then, you know, that's that's the choice you make as a parent. You kind of have to give your life over mm. for those first five years yeah. um, to help these little humans, you know, grow and develop. But, it, yeah, it's busy, but it's fun. It's Yeah, I get that. It's rewarding. I was thinking that the other day, you know, um, you know, with all the memories you make in the past growing up and how much you cherish them, when you have a child after that, you know, you sort of – you, you fig- I, for myself, I sort of forget it was like I'm happy to forget the memories for what's coming. Do you know what I mean? Like for the mm. um, adventures you're about to have. Is that right? Do you- look, every, yeah. Look, every every stage they're in is the best stage. We go, mm. oh, when was the best time? It's like every every time. Or the best time is always the time you're having now. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think you just got to stay in the moment. Kids are really great with that. They're always in the moment. They're yeah. never thinking too far ahead or too far in the past. So yeah. I think in that way. Children are really great teachers for us because they really are so in the now. And as mm. adults, we can learn a lot from them in that respect. Oh, so, yeah, now you with two twins, yeah, you probably pretty much had your work cut out for you, yeah? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with the uh, music and stuff like that, how did you how did you get into the whole reality show thing? Because you were a part of a, a reality show called Pop Stars, is that right? I was, that is correct. Um, Yeah, it was a bit of an accident really. Uh, One of my friends had found out about this competition and she got in touch with me and basically um, wouldn't shut up about it until I agreed to go to this interview um, or audition, I should say. So, yeah, it was. So I just sort of thought, well, what have I got to lose? I don't really want to be in a pop band, but I Mm. may as well, you know, go to an audition. And at that point, it was the first audition I'd ever done. Oh, wow. So at 24, yeah, so I was really nervous, but mm. I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. If if I progress through the process, so be it, and if I don't, don't. So I think that because I wasn't putting my whole life's dream, you know, on top of this audition, I was yeah. able to get more and more relaxed as the process went on. Mm. Whereas I know a lot of people that went to that were like, oh, my God, I've got to get in this band or my life is over, you know, and, yeah. and that level of pressure that people were putting on themselves, I think, really counted them out in the end. Mm. So what was the experience like being part of this reality show? It was really intense. Uh, We had to learn things very, very fast, and I Mm. think that was really the main point of the way they auditioned us so Mm. quickly uh, and so intensely. Um, And once I got in the band, I realised the value of that because once we were selected, um, there was no off switch. We were always busy. We were always either at the gym doing our training or we were at the studio recording or we were doing interviews or we were at a photo shoot or we were storyboarding costume ideas or we were doing dance rehearsals. Like it was just never ending. Every day was full. Yeah. Um, you know, there were no off days and that was how it was for, for a year and a half. Oh, wow. I think I remember we had one. 10-day break yep. uh, in that time 
and we might have had like a week off over Christmas. But other than that, it was pretty much 24-7 the whole time. So, um, yeah, so the audition process really set the bar for what the reality of the reality show was going to be. Okay. So after you, obviously, you won, you won the show, got selected to be part of Bardo, right? Did you get much time to yourself or was, was it, like you said, 24-7? Yeah, so refer back to what I just said. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, no. No, no time. Um, you know, you're up at 6, you're at the gym at 7. Yeah. Come back, have breakfast. You're at the studio by 10. Mm. We were there often until midnight. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's pretty and late. That's, that's, a, that's a recording day, lots of waiting around. No. Um, or if it was a media day, you'd be doing media interviews from nine through five and then mm. maybe have a rehearsal in the evening or maybe do a performance. Yeah. Um, just every hour of every day was scheduled for months on end. Oh, wow. Um, we might have gotten the occasional Sunday here and there mm. um, where generally I would, I don't know, go out, catch up with some friends, stay up too late. But, um, mm. yeah, and, and for a lot of that process we were sharing a house. So you've got five girls in a three-bedroom apartment yeah. Um, there really wasn't any personal no, okay. space. And I think that's why we had, you know, a bit of friction along the way because you just, it was like being in, we were in lockdown, you know. We, yeah, were, yeah. <laughs> we were in the original lockdown, mm. reality TV show <laughs> lockdown where yeah. you just, there was nowhere to go. You know? Oh, what? Um, so, yeah, that, that, that along with all of the schedule itself, yeah. that inability to actually get our own space was, was really quite stressful um, right. at times. Yeah. yeah, so that sort of leads me into the ne- next question I had. Was there any challenges, you know? Um, was, was it an easy ride or was it there was always bumps along the way? No, it wasn't easy at all. Um, mm. It was gruelling. It mm. was really hard work. Um, I mean, you had the emotional challenge of trying to get along well with people that you've really only just met. Mm. Um, so, you know, we were all new Friends, we knew we had to build friendships fast, yeah. Um, but that doesn't always go easily. Mm. Um, but you know, we had to have a good working relationship, and and to make that work, you've got to have a, a relatively good um, personal relationship. So that was a difficult balance in itself. Um, yeah. I think the challenging thing for me mentally was how little singing we got to do. Oh what? Uh, I. Compared to all of the other stuff that we would do. So, you know, if you look at the whole schedule, other than the recording process, so once that was done, mm. when we were touring, most of our time was interviews, yeah. photo shoots, radio, so radio interviews, um, TV interviews or media print interviews. You'd be on the phone, like taking call after call. Like you'd, as yeah. if we would all be in our own room yeah. fielding We'd have a, a sheet, a list of, you know, 10 different radio stations all timed that were calling in that all wanted their own original, um, you know, interview with someone. Mm. We would take calls literally from nine till five and then we would get ready, get changed, go out to do a performance, mm. um, maybe sign autographs for like two hours after the performance. And um, But the singing part was like 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. The I whole day. That. Yeah. Right? Compared to everything else, and then half your time you're spending in Taragos and aeroplanes and buses, and I mean, it's just it was like 10% singing and 90% marketing yeah, yeah. of the product mm. that was Bardo. So, did you? Um, and, yeah, you know, keep going, sorry. No, no, you're good. No, no. So, did you, did you enjoy traveling at all? Did you enjoy getting to be on the move around the country? Oh, look, absolutely. The, the upsides were definitely, you know, getting to see every every country town, every major city in Australia. Uh, yeah. We got to travel all through Southeast Asia, so I got to visit countries that I probably would never have been to, to yeah. Taiwan, to Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, um, Thailand, all of these places, yeah. uh, Malaysia. It's really great to, to get a taste of the culture. Yeah. Um, and then just before the second album, when that started, we were over in London and starting to um, inch into that market. So that was great to get yeah. to do a little bit of overseas travel. Mm. Um, but, yeah, definitely moving around the country. But even while we were travelling, you know, we were always working. So it wasn't mm. like we got a lot of off time to actually see some of the places. We would just see lots of aeroplanes and buses and, 
Yeah. I don't know. I, I think some people think the rock and roll lifestyle is, you know, glamorous because you're traveling a lot. It's like for the first three or four trips, it's fun. Yeah. And then after a while, you're like, okay, I'm, I've am i been on a plane twice a day, every day for the last three weeks. Mm. So It you- stops being fun after the first couple. You're just like, okay, <laughs> I've got my eye thing. I've got my, <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know. It just becomes part of the job. Uh, so, um, but yeah, there were highlights along the way. Mm, so you get over the honeymoon period pretty quick after a few a few travels, yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, because yeah, everyone you learn to carry carry lots of baraka, <laughs> lots of baraka, lots of. I'm not kidding. Oh, we really? would, I think my my go to move was like two barakas in a bottle of you know 600 ml water, <laughs> and I would drink that on every flight, oh, and that really helped. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Otherwise, you just you get so exhausted, get so tired. I'm going to have to, yeah, keep that tip on for in future when I do some travel because, yeah, traveling can be really dehydrating, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, how were you perceived in Southeast Asia? What was that like? Um, because I always thought of Bardo as an Australian band that really didn't travel much out of Australia, but, you know, learning today that, um, yeah, you did get to travel throughout Southeast Asia. What was that like? Yeah, it was it was insane, actually. I mean, we thought that the crowds we were pulling in Australia were pretty big. You know, mm. we did some shopping centre, um, even just shopping centre appearances, 12,000, 18,000 people chopping up there, and we thought that was pretty mad. Um, but the album went double platinum in Singapore as well, so that was kind of our hot spot in, um, oh, wow. in Southeast Asia. So mm. when we landed at Singapore Airport, we were shocked that there were thousands of people with signs and placards and in costume waiting, pressed up against the bus for us to arrive. And Mm. it was just, it was like nothing we'd experienced in Australia. So it was that next level fan crazy. Yeah. Um, So that was really exciting. That Mm. was quite like, wow, now we feel really, really famous. (laughs) Um, And they were just, I don't know, so wild, Um, much more wild than the Australian audiences. Like they were keen, but, um, yeah, the Asian audiences were really, really fun. They just love their pop. Mm. Um, And I think that's the difference. You know, in Australia, pop music was still kind of not really accepted. You know, it's like you're either into Aussie rock or what are you into, you know. Australians still have that kind of, you know, Jimmy Barnes, cold chisel vibe mm. in their in their blood, which, you know, all respect to that, um, those bands and him. But um, it was great to be in a country where pop was like, that was it. That was all they were into. Um, so they loved us and that was, yeah, it was heaps of fun. I always think that um, pop music, they don't get the same level as respect as, you know, songwriters and bands and stuff like that, Yeah. They don't. I mean, look, as a songwriter myself, I I can understand the differential because as a pop singer, most pop singers don't write the songs, they don't write the music, they're just singing someone else's lyrics. Essentially, any karaoke singer can be made into a pop singer. And with pop, it is all about the image, you know, Mm. it's all about the look. Um, And I've met so many record producers over time that when I started doing some songwriting independently later on, they were surprised. They'd go, oh, we thought you were a pop singer, but you're not. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, you can sing. Yeah. <laughs> and they sing, would say to me, you know, every other pop sing, pop singer that mm. we have come through the studio, you know, they've got to use so much auto-tune and they have to chop up all the takes and make it work. And um, so that was kind of from a production point of view that pop singers traditionally mm. are seen as just a visual product who maybe can sing, maybe can't, doesn't really matter. Mm. They get churned around and, and spewed out the other end. So, you know, from, as a musician, I can understand that it's easy to point the finger and go, you know, pop yeah. singers are not as not as um, credible. Yeah. But having been in the band, mm. um, what is real is the amount of work that goes into presenting that product, mm. whether you've written that song or not, whether that's your natural hair colour or not, whether you're, you know, whatever get up you've got on is real or not, yeah. it's still bloody hard work and I think everyone in the industry deserves some respect because, you know, we're all doing it tough and we're all doing it hard and we're all working mm. 10 hours a day longer than everybody else. So, yeah, so I, I understood it but, um, yeah. yeah. So were you writing music before you got into Pop Stars or Bardo? 
Not hugely. I was in a jazz band before the audition for pop stars. So yeah. I've, I've always been musical, but I wasn't really writing at that point. Mm. Um, and that wasn't something that I seriously got into until after I left the band. So when I got to work with Disco Montego yeah. and recorded Beautiful and Magic, um, yeah. I got a chance to uh, to write, to co-write Beautiful. So that was really satisfying. Mm. Um, and then to receive a songwriting award for that was just the icing on the cake. So that was probably my first... Um, feeling of validation as a total package, not just a good singer and a look, but someone who can actually write something that's going to be commercially successful. So that felt like a big win. Um, and, yeah, and there's just been a few others, obviously, over the years. What was it like working with Darren and Dennis? They were brilliant. Mm. Um, they were workaholics. Okay. Uh, in that At that time they were also partyaholics, so it was all work. <laughs> all play, yeah. all the time. Uh, there was no off switch. Um, so when I was touring with them, when we were touring Beautiful for a couple of years, it was a lot of fun, mm. but I definitely drank way too much during those <laughs> years uh, yeah. and that made the travel plans a little bit more insane come yeah. the morning. Yeah. I remember one morning we were, I don't even know, what time we'd gone to bed mm. and next thing we knew it was nine o'clock and our tour managers at the door going, uh, guys, we've got like an hour to get to the airport yeah. and you're not even, no one's even in their rooms. You didn't know where everyone was and we're all like ah, dragging <laughs> ourselves together. It was horrible. Um, apparently we were having a good time but, yeah, I look back on that and just shake my head at my young Mm. Young, foolish self. <laughs> so in comparison to Bardo, the, the Disco Montego period was much more fun. Yeah. Um, not as much fun for my liver, but lots of fun <laughs> for my, you know, mid-20s uber pop star dance icon, you know, period. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was good fun. It was yeah. good fun for a couple of years. But like anything, too much of a good thing can become just too much. So, yeah. No, yeah. If, if there's anything I can tell you, Mauritians love to drink. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, lifestyle aside, they were incredibly talented producers mm. and writers and singers. And, um, you know, in the early days of working with them, it was quite intimidating because even though I was, you know, always fairly confident in my own skills and my own talent, mm. um, you know, there were days they would just open up their mouths to sing or, or down would pick up the guitar and play something. And it was just like, man, it's just how can you pack that much talent into one <laughs> human body? I just couldn't understand it. Mm. So they were just brilliant to uh, to work with. Well, yeah, I, I would put them as a team. They were on like genius level. I, I felt when they really um, were when uh, I think it was Darren in the past. Uh, I felt like that Australia really lost some really yep. like a gold nugget, like some real talent there. You know, because I remember the song that they wrote yeah. uh, as Kaylin. Uh, Rock me all night, and that was a, like yeah. for me. That was like on par with American music, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Do you remember that song? Well, the, the, yeah, I do. And the the tragedy was that they had just moved to the states, and they were mm. just starting to work with some other really big name uh, artists and producers over there. And it was just, uh, I mean, the obvious shock, you know, yeah. that Darren was unwell, and then and then his passing. But just the timing of it, you know, they would just getting started really yeah. on the international scale and it was just tragic from a professional point of view that, yeah, that we um, we didn't get to continue to see what they could have been capable of as a, as a team. Yeah. But, look, Dennis went on and did some incredible stuff. When he formed Electric Empire, I think, was when I hooked back into what he'd been doing. Yeah. Um, and I remember going to one of the gigs that he did in Melbourne and, and listening through that album and it's just sublime. If you haven't heard of it, Electric Empire, um, was the last album that he did. Um, yeah. yeah, it was just just stunning, just really stunning body of work. Yeah, believe it or not, that's actually on my to-do list to do next is to listen to that album. I was just having a look into him yesterday. Um, do and, it, yeah. do it. You won't regret it. There's some <laughs> golden golden nuggets on that on that oh, album. Oh, definitely, I'll do that. So, um, being in the music industry and stuff like that, is it mentally? Can it be really mentally taxing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh. Yes, it can. 
Um, I think uh, the things I can speak from my own experience, I'm sure people find it stressful for different reasons. Mm. Um, the things that stood out to me, so I was married through the Bardo years and through the, the Disco Montego years. So mm. being apart from my husband was difficult. Yeah. Um, so it was taxing for me personally, the feeling of isolation. I was away from my friends and my mm. family and my husband and yet spending all my time with these other people who, depending on what day it was, I was getting along with or wasn't getting along with. So mm. that was really difficult. Um, and then he used to complain to me quite a lot about yeah. being away. He never complained about the money that yeah. I was bringing in, but he did complain um, mm. about me not being around. And I remember saying, because he was yeah. a doctor, oh. saying, you know, you can't have it both ways. You want mm. me to earn heaps of money, but yet you want me to be home every night at 5 o'clock cooking your meal? Like yeah, what? Yeah what are you talking about, you know? So, I mean, that was a very, um, at times, a very disturbing relationship. So that yeah. was probably the most intense um, part of that that was taxing me. You know, work was stressful enough, fun, mm. but stressful. And then I would go home and have to deal with the stress of, you know, this stupid reverse yeah. expectation of I want my trophy wife to earn $100,000 oh. a year but still be yeah. home to cook me dinner and go to functions with me. And it was, yeah, well, yeah, I get that, that didn't last. I, anyway. I, think, I think when you um, when you start to make a high income, you've got to start making sacrifices, you know, because um, the more income that you make basically, the more time it takes off your hands. Is that right? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, no. Nice. And, you know, um, and the thing is we weren't, you know, we were working for a record company. So it's not like I could just say, oh, you know what, I need to take, uh, you know, June the 6th off because I've got a 40th birthday. There was no, you didn't get consulted. Well, or are you girls free to yeah. do an East Coast tour? It's like, no, mm. the record company sets down the dates and you go. Yeah, I get There's that. There's no... I'm not available. Like the only option is if someone got really sick and I don't think that ever happened. I know Belinda got really ill on a flight once mm. back from overseas. That was really scary. Um, but, yeah, we were we were just really busy and so it was kind of out of my hands. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was, yeah, it was difficult. And even just being separated from friends, you know, long-time friends that I'd have and mm. um, – not being able to connect with them. And I lost a lot of friends because, you know, when you've got this, some sorts of friends that if you don't see them a lot, they just lose interest. Mm. Um, so I was left with you really just, you know, a small handful, one or two good friends yeah. who would either come away with me on uh, occasion um, or would stay in touch. But, yeah, it's it was – it that, that whole situation became weird too. And then when you get famous, people act weird around you. And that's yeah. hard to process. You yeah. know, people that I'd known for 10 years suddenly like fangirling around me. It's, I just wanted to slap them. Go, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, yeah. what are you doing? I'm this, exactly the same person mm. that I was before. I've just got this strange job now where my head is everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, other than that, nothing's changed. Yeah. Um, but when you're inside the machine it's hard to see what it looks like from the outside and people get weird so <laughs> so um you know did it make it hard for you to go out in public being that you were this pop star yes <laughs> <laughs> well like there was people yeah. like stopping you everywhere asking for autographs wanting to take photos yeah. Did, yeah. did you enjoy that all at all that. uh a bit like the airplane travel yeah. it was probably fun the first three, four, five, ten times, mm. and then eventually you realise you can't go anywhere without people coming up to you, interrupting you. Um, and when people start doing things like coming up to your table at a restaurant when you're trying to have a dinner with your family mm. or your friends, mm. um, that's really invasive. Yeah. Um, or worse than that, you'll come out of a bathroom stall all right. <laughs> like literally just step out of the toilet mm. between the toilet and the basin. They want to pull you up for a photo and a <laughs> autograph. I'm not kidding. Oh, what uh, Stuff gets a bit like, okay, um, can I just wash my hands and I'll be right with you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, people get all kinds of crazy and that that the novelty of that sort of wore off. So, yeah, often people say, oh, do you miss being famous? I'm like, no, I don't. Not that kind of famous. Yeah, yeah, I get like, that. I'd like to be famous enough that I could, you know, make a little money, but 
not at the expense of privacy everywhere and to basically have to stop going out. Mm. Um, and that's what I did in the end. We would just have people over for dinner or, um, you know, if I wanted to have a dance, we'd just have a party at home and um, it just became too hard to go out in public um, without being, you know, pulled up by people for photos and autographs the whole time. So, yeah. So you lose, yeah. you lose, lose a while, but that wears off. You lose a lot of your freedom, yeah? Yes, you do. Uh, that's, that's the sad thing about being famous, I guess, yeah? Well, you know, at the time you're earning a lot of money, so, you know, quid pro quo. But, yeah, um, but yeah you do, you, I mean, you, you gain freedoms in some places. I mean, mm. this is the irony, isn't it? You know, you yeah. can walk into a restaurant and they'll give you the best seat in the table, but they can't protect you from the three people that will come up and interrupt you through yeah. dinner to get a photo and an autograph. Yeah. You know, so it's like, okay, it's a little bit good, but a little bit shit. So yeah, I get that. depends what kind of life you want, you know. Mm. Um, for me, I, I, if I'm going to go out for dinner, I want to just enjoy myself with the people at my table, you know. So yeah. I think that's the thing I came to realise after stepping out of the commercial music industry mm. was that my whole being was able to actually relax. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you want to fix that? <laughs> Would you sacrifice, what would you rather, the, the fame or the money? Oh, like, not the fame and the money. Would you rather the freedom or the the money and fame? Freedom because that's what I chose. I could have stayed in the business. I yeah. didn't have to leave. Uh, okay. Um, sure. But, yeah, it got, uh, and, and without going into detail where, but it got to the point where I was in a particular situation where I was earning good money for every gig mm. but I hated my manager. He was a bit of a crook. Yeah. And um, I just hated being away and then when I would get there it would be hard work and then the people I was working with at times were not nice to me oh. or rude and it just became an unpleasant working environment and, you know, and just hard slog on the road. And I just thought, you know what, no amount of money is worth sacrificing all of my personal life mm. just so I can keep you know, playing this game. So that was really the the step towards changing industries altogether and moving into training, retraining myself to mm. be in the wellness industry. Yeah. Um, because it's, you know, I never wanted to be famous. Yeah. Um, I'd love to be rich again, don't get yeah. me wrong, um, especially <laughs> mm. now with kids, you know, I'll take the money. But I think the bottom line for me is not at any cost. Yeah. So um, what motivated yeah. you to to get into the change of the wellness industry. or I, I look at it, when I look at your profile, I see a bit of spirituality, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it's evolved. You know, my professional career has evolved, I suppose, in parallel with my own personal development. Mm. So I started um, learning about and practicing meditation probably about 40, no, no sorry, 15 years ago. Mm. Um, so began with my personal practice and then – that led me into realizing that I wanted to train as a massage therapist. It was something that I was always interested in as a child. My mum yeah. was a beautician uh, in her early career and she taught me some basic massage skills when I was nine years old. Yeah. And I used to massage my aunties and uncles for like, you know, a dollar or two dollars. Mm. Um, and that was a real thrill, not just for the coin, but because I was enjoying the fact that I was doing something and they were enjoying it. So I'd always had that side in me mm. um, and when it came to you know reconsidering well what do I do now if I'm not going to be a performer mm. um, it it's sort of the penny just dropped one day and I'm like of course I always love that I, I'll go back to that so it was really really satisfying and very humbling to yeah. have to start as a beginner again you mm. know in the massage industry no yeah. one gives gives a toss <laughs> what I did before yeah you know they're not there for a song they're there to get adequate treatment so um, but it was very, it was refreshing. I think it was good for my soul to just have to restart back at zero mm. um, and uh, and start again. And then around that same time I had, my, my girls were born. Yeah. So then I had to put everything on hold for those first few years. Mm. Um, and fairly soon after they were born, I became a single parent. So that made things even more challenging. So, you know, for about a good five years, I kind of dropped off the radar and I you know, I was still doing a little bit of work, but mostly I was a mum. That was my job to, you know, help grow these humans. Um, and it wasn't until they started school 
that then I was able to really look at my career again. And basically when they started at school, that's when I started my training in sound healing, in meditation teacher um, training. Mm. Um, I did my Reiki level one and two um, and then have continued to develop and train in, in sound healing over the years. So, yeah, but as a parent I had to just kind of put everything on hold for a few years and just give my all to them. Yeah. So yeah. what I noticed that you've got um, on Spotify you've got some uh, – meditation music how did that all come about how did you get into that do you do any singing in that <laughs> yeah so that's all me yeah. um in fact all of the sounds on there so i i would i was already running um live sound healing events where i would use a looping machine and i would layer my voice mm. using matches or intuitive vocalizations but also other instruments that i have and i use in my live events uh, crystal bowls tibetan bowls chimes a mm. hand pan um, and some African and native drums. Yeah. So I'd been doing those events live for about two or three years before um, people started to ask me, oh, do you have CD? You know, that it wasn't enough then for them to be at the events. They mm. wanted more. And it was really from a lot of my regular guests' encouragement to go, you know, you should make an album. You need to release this stuff because mm. I would buy it. Um, and that was really where it started. So Madrigal was the first album that I produced and that was all to – every sound that you hear, either sung or played, is by me and that's how all my albums are. Mm. Um, so, yeah, Madrigal was the first and then Journey to Mantra and I started to introduce some Vedic um, and Tibetan mantras, which I use a lot in my personal practice um, and professional practice. Uh, and then my last album, which I released just earlier this year, called mm. Awaken, which, again, sort of followed my – as my personal journey into mantra and the passionate love of mantra increased, I wanted to reflect that in the albums that I was creating. Oh. Um, and now I'm working on my fourth studio album, which is wow. uh, a double album, and that one is a two-hour project, a two-hour yeah. double album, which is designed specifically for sleep. So I've called that Mantra Dreaming, and it's all vocals, all mantras, still with some subtle drumming and other instrumentation. but. Yeah. Yeah, really just designing to help people relax, which everybody needs. I get that. Uh, sleep's very mm. important, you know, especially for repairing the body at night, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. So, um, um and yeah. No, I was just going to say um, parents especially, you know, are often sleep deprived or people that will struggle to get babies and kids to sleep. And I get a lot of good feedback from people who listen to my mm. music and say, oh, it helps my my toddler or my baby or my dog, you know, go to sleep or my husband <laughs> go to sleep. Um, um, and that's really what inspired me to um, to start the theme for this album that I'm working on now. So how long does it take you to produce an album? <sighs> Usually I don't start recording until I mm. feel like I have a strong sense of what the, the overall theme is and mm. then I have an idea of the specific um, like every every album has kind of a cohesive theme or story yeah, to yeah. it in a sense. Um, so in this case, I started recording mid-July mm. and if Melbourne hadn't gone into lockdown, I would have probably just now finished the recording process. So that's actually probably the fastest I've ever done. Mm. But usually then once you finish recording, so the recording process, depending on how much time I have, could be as quick as a month or it could be as long as three months. Mm. Um, and then turnover time usually to get CDs produced, artwork done, USBs made uh, would probably be another month after that. So, yeah, anywhere between – I'd probably say three to four months would be the average. Yeah. Um, and I was hoping to have this one out in September, but now f until mid-September in Melbourne yeah. um, I can't record uh, yeah. and I can't move the project forward. So I'm just practising patience at the moment <laughs> and then we'll, we'll get back to it as soon as we can. All right. So you do everything yourself, yeah? The whole kitten caboodle. I work with an engineer. I don't. I don't run the computer. I don't do sound engineering. So I mm. play all the instruments and I sing and I do all the arrangements and of course all of the, the melodic and musical structures I bring in. 
Um, but this producer that I work with, Steve, he's incredibly talented. He's also a classical musician in his own right. So he has a really sharp ear for music, which I respect. Mm. Um, but he does all of the um, engineering, all the sound engineering and the mixing and mastering for me. So we make a good team. Oh, awesome. So, oh, look, I'll just wrap it up, right? But I wanted to ask you, um, for anyone that's aspiring um, if I, I know there's no pop stars around. Oh, well, actually, there is some uh, music reality shows. Would you would you recommend people to go through the process or would you be like, nah, just slug it out and, you know, work on your own personal music and try and get there out on your own merit? I don't think there's a right way and a wrong way. Mm. Uh, I think my advice on that would be take every opportunity that you can. Mm. And, you know, if there's a reality TV show and you think you've got a chance of making it through and you're young, Mm. go for it. Sure, if you get through, they'll work you to the bone and you'll get exploited and your manager will rip you off (laughs) and your record company will work you to the bone and you'll never see your family and friends for two years. But that apprenticeship might just be the boost that then can get you a foot in the door with some really great producers or some really great writers or maybe you'll get into a musical or other opportunities can come. Mm. Um, but having said that, I don't think you have to be in a reality TV show to make it, you know, yeah. and there's uh, many, many people that have made an impact through just straight out touring um, or maybe you've become a YouTube star or whatever. There's, there's so many different ways that you can make it. Mm. There is no guarantee yeah. That's the tricky thing. So there's no one path that's going to work or not work. I think my idea would be, you know, hone your craft. Yeah. If you're a musician, yeah. if you play guitar, play the best damn guitar you can play. If you're a singer, sing every day. Mm. Um, you know, if you want to be a writer, write songs. Write lots of terrible songs yeah. <laughs> because that's what it takes mm. To get to that, I wrote heaps of terrible songs before I finally wrote a great song. Oh, okay, right? 20 yeah. or 30 pretty goddamn average songs. <laughs> but you've got to do that. Mm. That's part of the process. So I think, you know, it, it's just see it as an opportunity and the more the better prepared you are for that opportunity when it arrives, then you'll make the most of those uh, chances when they come along. Uh, okay. And don't drink too much. <laughs> Honestly, just don't. Yeah. I, I lost so many opportunities because I was mentally taxed due to my, you know, drug and alcohol yeah. tendencies at that age. I, mm. If I could go back and do it differently, I would grab oh, wow. myself by the scruff of the neck and just go, just stop doing all of that um, and – yeah, who knows? It could have been a very different story. But yeah. having said that, everything I've done has led me now to where I am. Uh, so now I'm in a job that I love with a family I adore yeah. and I'm in the best of health, body and mind that I've ever been in. So yeah, it all happened the way it was supposed to. So so the lesson from, from it to take is that take care of your body basically and you'll be able to reach better potentials if you don't abuse it with alcohol and drugs and stuff like that, yeah? Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> so, um, Katie, I want to thank you very much for coming on to my show today. Um, if my guests want to be able to, I don't know, reach out to you or listen to some of your, some of your music and stuff like that, what can they do to, yeah, sort of connect with you with your material? Sure. Lots of options. So if you're interested in the music, you can go onto iTunes, Apple Music or Spotify. Mm. Just search for Katie Underwood and you'll find those three albums that I've mentioned. Yeah. Um, so you can grab the music there. If you want to connect with me, find out what I'm doing online. I'm doing lots of online sound healing, mantra and meditation events, which I'm just starting up this week. So you can find me on Facebook under Underwood Healing yeah. or you can visit my website, which is kind of actually in a <laughs> in a transitional <laughs> period, but you can go to the website, yeah. which is underwoodpeeling.com. Mm. Or if you're on Instagram, I'm at, I'm at, at, at Katie <laughs> Underwood Healing uh, is the handle on Instagram. So you can connect with me there, message me there. Um, yeah. Awesome. That's all right. All the, all the things. All right. Well, I'll leave some, dis- uh, some links down in the description below to help the people out there viewing. Um, okay, great. 
But yeah, from all my viewers here, if you enjoyed today's episode, smash the like button. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you can uh, keep up to date with the uh, new episodes coming out. But from myself here, Neil Coots and Katie Underwood, thank you very much and have a good day.